Smart Alex Show, baby! All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us today on the Smart Alex Show podcast. We have another very special guest with us today. This individual is someone who, whether he knows it or not, his class and his teachings actually had a profound effect on the way I go about my business. Um, he's the very first Hispanic or Latino professor that I've had in college period, and one of my all-time favorite professors I've ever had. He's a learned lawyer who also wields a Master of Science in Philosophy and Public Policy from the London School of Economics. He's run his own family business before. He's worked as the VP of a healthcare company on the legal side of things. And he now operates his own legal practice. And correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Kavanaugh and Quintanilla. There we go. Kavanaugh, Quintanilla. Mm -hmm. Kavanaugh, yeah. Quintanilla. There we go. You can pay me for the endorsement later. <laughs> um, yeah. So welcome, David Quintanilla, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, yeah, how you doing, Mr. Q? I'm um, great, Alex. Yeah. Well, and and obviously, you know, let me just say thank you for for your kind words. You know, I I um when I had you as a student, I think that was I think it was my second semester teaching, um, and I'll never forget it was the second day of class. It was after the second day of class, you came up and talked to me, and shared you know that you had never taken a, a a class with with a Hispanic professor before, and I remember just being like, on the one hand not surprised on the other hand like wow you know i mean you know the state is uh gosh 42 percent uh latinx you know hispanic and and you're at the the largest university public university in the state and and it just shouldn't be that way um i think it says a lot about about uh, how far we have to go especially you know given everything that's going on around us so um you know I, I appreciate your kind words uh very much and and uh but again i think the the fact that um uh that the the context that you put around it just really says a lot um yeah about where we are i i totally agree you know until i took your class i had never really sat there and thought about it like that because i started thinking i was like wait is this really the first hispanic professor i've ever had and i was like yeah because i did a year at community and i've done a few years at ut now about to wrap up and i was like is this really the only latino professor yeah. that i've ever had and i was like yeah that's that's mind-blowing and like you said it really sheds light on you know the the state of the situation and really how far we have to go man it uh sure it's a whole other conversation in and of itself yeah part, yeah. yeah yeah it's it's uh crazy to think of but yeah yeah glad glad i, I signed up for that class yeah and we, and I, we able to me as well and class. thank you for having me <laughs> <laughs> well yeah um so so mr q what, what's your legal expertise man and how did you know you wanted to not only be a lawyer but work within your specific niche of, of law sure so so actually you know i actually would say that i'm not sure i have um you know one specific uh niche area um and you know i mean i guess i i do the little bit of law practice i still do is predominantly around um business law, so I'm helping people create businesses, I'm helping people uh, review contracts, create contracts, review leases, write leases, I gotta do one of those today actually. Um, and and then wills and estate planning. Those are kind of the two areas that I spend most of my time um, focused on. But but the reason I say that, I, you know, I hesitate to, to kind of put myself in, in some niche category is, you know, if you recall, um, the class that I, that I taught for you, the class that I still teach, business law and ethics, I think that I love about the class and the reason why I spend as much time as I possibly can teaching and, and not as much time practicing law, uh, as much as I enjoy it, I don't, I don't love it like I love teaching. And the thing, <clears throat> one of the things I love about teaching the class that I, that I have the opportunity to teach is it's basically like a survey class of law school, right? So I, because of my business background, because of my graduate degree in, in philosophy and public policy, um, because of the, you know, the things that I'm interested in, in politics and certainly in ethics, um, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to gain a, a you know, um, a wealth of experience in, in different areas, including, you know, as you mentioned, working in healthcare for, for a few years. Um, and that's what I love about what I do now in teaching and, and being a, a, somebody who teaches business ethics and business law, because I know a decent amount about a, a lot of stuff. Right now, are there people that know a, a lot more than I do about contracts? Oh yeah, a lot more than I do about torts. Oh yeah, a lot more than I do 
right? About criminal law, uh, you know, about securities law, right? All the stuff you remember, like these are the days yeah, that yeah. we had, right? I remember, uh, all the different things. I remember yeah, all the law. That was, uh, I really got into the weeds and torts. That was, that was yeah. a whole deal. In yeah, and it's fun. And I, I had the opportunity to teach all those things, right? And, and I feel um, I, it's a lot of fun for me because it's like every day, I, I'm diving back in or I'm, I'm getting something new, right? We're, today we're talking about agency law and then next, you know, next time we're talking about, you know, again, criminal law or, or what have you. And that's a lot of fun for me. That's the way my, yeah. you know, I, I get bored kind of easy, right? And so I, I think that uh, for me, it's just a great, it's a great setup um, because I have the opportunity to teach a good amount about a lot of stuff instead of spending, you know, four months on one thing. Um, we spend, you know, a class or maybe two or three classes and we get to con law. If you remember, like I expand that stuff cause it's just so important. Um, and so we spend, you know, three, maybe four classes on con law. So, um, so that's kind of just in terms of what I do, uh, the, the, the thing that I just love so much about, or one of the things I love so much about it is cause I get to be able to talk about a whole bunch of different things. Um, in terms about, you know, in terms of knowing that I wanted to be a lawyer, I didn't go to law school. I started law school when I was either 29 or 30. So I worked for a number of years first. And, and the whole thing there was, you know, I enjoyed what I did. I enjoyed working um, for the family business, working with my family. I really enjoyed that a lot. But I just wasn't passionate about selling tacos, right? Like, I, you know, and, and I get like, you know, I family members that, that were and that are, like that's their, that's their calling. They want to, to, to make people happy through, you know, this experience that people walk in and, and, and share that kind of, you know, the, the neighborhood restaurant. And, um, and I get that and I respect the hell out of that. I just, I didn't get the same kind of, um, you know, passion. I didn't have the same passion for it that some of my family members did. And so, you know, I wanted to, to find something that I guess could, uh, that I could, I could be more into, so to speak. And, um, I didn't know when I went into law school, I didn't know what, where that was going to lead, but I knew that it would open up opportunities and, and it did. Um, a, a number of them, in fact. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it was just kind of, you know, after law school was to graduate school in London for a year with the family. And then after that, it was opening up my own law firm. And then it was running for office. And then it was working in healthcare. I should say working in healthcare, then running for office, getting my ass handed to me, you know, in a, in a very public <laughs> way. But but knowing that I, you know, I, I, I went for it, feeling good about that. Um, and then having the opportunity, obviously, to teach at UT, which is just um, such an awesome, awesome opportunity. Yeah. I just, I just, I love love what I do. I really and do. I, and I can attest to that. You, you truly do love what you do. You bring your passion and the energy to class. And in turn, that, that, that's infectious, right? Like the students get, get passionate about it. You, you retain more because you feel like you're into it. You know, it's not like business law that can be very, you know, a little bit dry at times. Dry. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. You, you brought an energy to it that made it more interesting, which in turn helped us out. Right. But yeah, no, that's, that. that's amazing that, uh, you know, you're passionate about it. And like you said, it's a wide range. There's a good amount about a lot of stuff to cover. Yeah. And yeah. Like you said, you know, um, that that's interesting, man, that uh, you had that self-awareness to say, like, this is awesome. You know, and some people in my family are passionate about our family and business, about selling tacos, but this yeah. isn't for me. So what do you think is, like, important for someone like kind of on that journey trying to trying to find what they want to do with their life their career and like i feel like there's like that optimal point between like passion and uh doing something because you love the process and also being able to like sustain a living you get what i'm saying sure absolutely yeah for sure well and 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 let me also just add that you know in one respect sorry um in one respect um you know i uh I was very beyond fortunate because um, the parents uh, that I'm so lucky to have and, and, you know, working with my dad specifically, you know, we had this conversation all the time that, you know, he loved the fact that we're working together and he loved the fact that we could, you know, grow a business together, but he would, he knew that I didn't love doing that. And, and he would say over and over like, son, go, you know, yeah. go find your passion, get out there. You know, I mean, it's, it's going to be hard. And I mean, look, when I started law school, um, I had two daughters and then my son was born right in the middle of law school, like smack dab in little middle law school. That was not the plan, by the way, <laughs> but you know, but life happens as my wife and I say, and, and it was hard. I was commuting back and forth to, to St. Mary's and, and San Antonio. And um, it was, you know, there were many nights and we were like, gosh, it'd be so much easier. We just would have stayed on the same path, you know, and we were both working for, for the restaurants and like, um, you know, like what have we gotten ourselves into? But you know, um, obviously when you're in the throes of it, 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 it's challenging, but no regrets whatsoever. It, it just really, 
um, has worked out so well. Um, and, you know, I, look, I think what I would say and what I often say to students and to, and to, to young folk that, that I talk to, I mean, I, I think there's, I think there's a, in my opinion, a little bit of misconception. It's important to, to think a lot about what you want to do. Right. I mean, obviously, I think that kind of goes without saying it's very important to kind of consider, you know, what what you're passionate about, what you want to do. But but I think the reality is, Alec, how old are you? I'm 22. You're 22. You don't know what you don't know. That's not your fault. Right. It's just you don't know what you don't know. You're 22. Ask me how much I knew at 22. Right. Probably a lot less than, you know, um, at, yeah, at 22. I just you know, I, I, you don't know what you don't know. And so I think that one of the challenges you know, that, that you all face right now, especially, you know, especially now that, I mean, there's middle schools that are focusing on like, you know, magnet schools that are like, you know, you're going to be a, you know, pre-med middle, you know, middle school or, or, you know, kind of the, the science, you know, uh, or the arts or whatever. And look, I have no beef with, with, you know, schools offering more options for kids. What I have a problem with is telling a 12 year old, Hey, so you're going to pick this path. And now you're going down this path, right, to go be pre-med in college or to go be, you know, um, gosh, I don't know, you know, a, a social science, you know, individual going forward. And it's like, man, they're 12, they're 13. You know, most people, it's hard to figure out what you want to do at 20, at 22, at 23. And so much of that stuff and that pressure starts early. And so for me, I really believe um, that so much of it is not just thinking about what you want to do and kind of what industry you want to be in, but where you want to do it. And what kind of people do you want to be around, right? I mean, because look, I could say, look, Alec, you know, two years from now, you could be working in an industry that you kind of feel meh about. And I hope that's not the case, but maybe you're, I don't know, you're in marketing and you're like, oh, I thought I'd like it. I don't, I don't love so much the marketing aspect, of it, but, but damn it, I love where I live and I love my team and I love the person I work for. And, and frankly, I love my, the, the company I work for. So the fact that, you know, I don't really love marketing is not that big of a deal to me because I love what I do because of all these other things. Now, that's not, it's not always easy to just to kind of, you know, it doesn't fall in your lap, right? Yeah. Um, but, but I think that a lot of people are like, man, I gotta, I gotta figure out exactly which industry I'm going into or else, man, I'm never gonna be happy. And I just don't, I mean, certainly it makes a big impact, right? Like, you know, wh where you're gonna go, where you're gonna go into finance, you're gonna go into marketing, you're gonna go into hospitality, you're gonna go into, you know, academia, you wanna go to law, you wanna, you know, uh, whatever it is, you want us to open up a small business. Um, I, all those things can, can be very different. But I think a, 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 something that is hard for 22 year olds to understand is, even if you pick the one industry or the one thing that you were just so passionate about, if you're doing it for a company that doesn't really, frankly, give a shit about you, your mm -hmm. boss, right, doesn't care much about you, your coworkers, right? Um, you don't jive with any of them. It's like, hey, you picked the right industry, you're so unhappy doing what you do, right? And so I think there's a lot, in, or, or where you are, right? I mean, do you want to be in Austin, Texas? Do you want to be in New York? Do you want to be in London? Do you want to be, right, in the country somewhere, right? That like, no you know, um, you, let's say you want to live on, I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. You want to live and have some property. Well, you can, you can do that working for a company in downtown Austin, of course, assuming that things somewhat go back to normal. Right now, I mean, you could probably do that from anywhere, right? Um, but let's assume that you're going to have an office job two, three years from now. I think there's a decent chance you will, decent chance you won't. But, you know, you could do that in Austin, Texas and still live 30 minutes outside of town and have a little spread for yourself, right? For you and your family or you and your buddies or whatever, two acres, three acres, five acres. You can't do that outside of New York City. Yeah, can't right? And, and, but people don't think about these things. And when you're going to all these career fairs, and you're thinking about stuff like, where do I want to live? Do I want to live in an urban area? Do I want to live in a high rise? If you do, well, hey, there's all kinds of places, but know that there's some trade-off there. If you want to have a little bit more space, you know, there's some things that you got to consider there as well. And, and I think those things matter. Do you want to be close to family, right? Like, you know, we tell our kids all the time, like, man, go wherever you want to go. We'll do everything we can to help you so long as you come back to mommy and daddy, right? Like, I mean, and obviously we're not, we can't require them to do that, but that's our hope, right? I mean, I went and and studied for you know for a year in london it was an amazing experience took the family with us and our dog and it was great but we always knew we were coming back to austin why because we wanted to raise our family around family right and so again i think things like that can have a really big impact on what it is that you do and where you end up um and it's just things that i don't think are are uh, you guys aren't challenged enough to think about these other things even though you don't have the answers to them right like what you know just give some thought to where you want to live, give some thought to, 
you know, do you want to be in a big city or, you know, a small town or give some thought to, you know, the kind of lifestyle you want to live outside of work, give some thought to those things. Um, again, all of which is not to say, you know, picking a, a career path or picking an industry is not important. It's incredibly important, but I just know that there's so many other things um, that go along with that, that, uh, that I don't think 22 year olds are encouraged, you know, to, to kind of consider, yeah. then you go down and you ask yourself five years from now, why am I not happy? Even though I picked the, you know, the, the area that I thought I would love the most, why am I not happy? Well, it's because, you know, all these other things, yeah. um, you know, often I, I find is the, is the case. So um, again, that said, if you can find a thing where, you know, you're, you're good at it, you can make money doing it and right. You enjoy it. Right. Those, you know, if you can kind of think of the Venn diagram, right. And this is not anything original to me is thing people talk about all the time. Right. I would add a fourth thing. If you can make the world a better place, right. While doing it, if you can find that sweet spot or even get, you know, two or three of those, I think, man, more power to you. I mean, that's, that's, that's awesome. And I feel kind of in my way, you know, in my little corner of the world, I've been able to, to, to do that. Right. I don't, I mean, you can, you can see that my, yeah. sal my well, salary is public. I can attest, um, to, I can attest to that. No, I think those are all like incredibly solid points. Right. I think like even at, even at my age, right you're still discovering a lot about who you are as a person, what you're good at, what you're not good at, the kind of people you mesh well around and the kind of people you don't. So I think even at, even, you know, coming out of high school as a freshman in college to have to make a decision about what you want to do with your life. That's going to affect sure. you're making a pick your major. Yeah. yeah. Pick your major, right. You're making a decision at 18 that could, could for better or for worse affect the next, you know, 40 years of your life. Sure. Well, even at 18, that's an immense decision. So I see where you're talking about when it's like pick a path at 12 years old. I can't imagine the amount of like pressure and lack of like, you don't even know what you don't know oh, at, okay. at this age, but at 12, yeah. it's like, how could you, I feel like you're kind of pigeon, pigeonholing yourself and you're kind of closing off your perspectives in terms of what yeah. could be. So like for me, um, I was majoring in finance at first. So when I took your class, I was like, I want to do finance, right? Yeah. Because um, I don't have many, many family members that, that went to college, but one of them, someone I consider like a mentor to me, my, my uncle, he, he majored in finance and it's gone well for him. So I was like, you know, maybe that's something I want to do. Sure. But I later realized that this isn't who I am. I think it's yeah. interesting, but it's not something I could do day in and day out, nor what I'm, I'm better at other things too. So it's like, I, I felt like it was a lot more people were going into that side of things, maybe for like extrinsic motivation, like a sure. status or financial gain, things like that. So it's like, sure. once I took those blinders off of like, that's not what I want to do. Let me do process of elimination to find out what sure. I, what I don't like first. And then I can figure out what I like. And once I kind of took those blinders off, the world opened up for me. Like I took class I was interested in, started yeah. meeting more people. Just, just life got a lot better for me when I took the blinders off. And I feel like that's the danger with kids, right? Like if you tell them, like, oh, yeah. you're going to go an engineering track, pre-med track, this track. You know, it, it's like pigeonholing yeah. them into something sure. that, they might, that might not even be for them, right? Like, yeah. Is that a yeah. problem with the, ed, ed, like, is that a problem specific to the education system that you think we're doing wrong? Or what, what I mean, is I think it's a... I, so, so to a certain extent, yes. I think the the reality is, and, and we could go down a whole rabbit hole here. So I'll be I'll be careful because this is when I ran for school board. This is a big thing <laughs> oh, for you're me. Right. But I, you know, I, I think the reality is what what schools are doing, both you know, public and private schools are doing, is they're they're answering, you know, to the the, the demand, right? Like there's a demand for parents to say, well, I you know, I want my kid to go to a a, a charter school. Excuse me, a you know, a magnet school. Um, I want my kid to have this specialized area. And look, let me say two things. One, there are some kids who, when they're 12, 13 year olds, they know exactly what they want to do. Sure. I think it's a small slice, but there are some and it's good for them. And it's like, man, if they have the opportunity to like start learning that stuff early on, think about, you know, that you think this 12 year old kid who's a genius and wants to go be a doctor and, and, you know, they could start learning all this stuff at 12 or at, you know, 19. And one day they're going to be doing cancer research. Well, Hey, let's start them at 12. Right. Like, I'm not saying that it just, you know, it's just completely a bad thing. I think the problem is, and this is the answer to your question, I think, is that, that too many parents who are well-intentioned, they think it's best for their kid, say, look, you'll have a better opportunity if you just go down this path. If you just stay on this path, and it's like, well, yeah, maybe financially, maybe, but man, do they really, is this what they want to do? Do they even know? Do you know? And, and so, you know, again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sit here for a second and say like, I know, you know, what 
other parents should be doing with their kids. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what I should do with my kids, right? I mean, it's not, it's not easy. Um, but what I would say is, you know, I think that there is a demand from so many parents that see like, oh, well, there's this middle school down the way that now is focusing on this. Well, we, you know, we want our principal to now create, you know, this kind of magnet program at our school. And it just, and the dominoes kind of continue to fall. And it's like, now there's this pressure for everybody to kind of specialize early on. And, and, and I'm just not, a, I'm not a fan of that. You know, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily just a public or private school education problem. I think it's also like, that's where the market is, right? Like that's what the demand is. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the parents are driving that, that, you know, that, you know, that ship. And, and so that's what's happening. I, I just wish that, and I think like many things, there's a pendulum, right? It'll swing. I think it's just, unfortunately right now, there's a lot of kids that are kind of being forced into things that I don't think they probably would, would choose left to their own, you know, left, left to themselves uh, and certainly down the road. So. I'm, I'm obviously not a parent, right? But it seems like an extremely delicate and um, tough, you know, um, thing being, being a parent, right? In terms of like trying to help your kid navigate their life for the better, right? Because it's like sure. certain moves you could make could uh, lead them down something that maybe isn't for them or, or you know, sure. negatively. So, so respect to you, yeah. man. Having yeah. a, another kid your third kid while in law school seems, uh, seems quite, quite insane to me. So respect yeah. you for making it through, yeah. through all that. That sounds, that sounds crazy. Alec, man. if I could just say something to that, because I think you bring up a good point when you say, you know, like, so my wife and I were very fortunate, right? We're fortunate to be able to have the privilege to say to our kids, hey, go, go be happy, right? Like, you know, you want to go to, I don't know, Harvard or Stanford or, you know, or, or, or Yale or UT, you know, you have to work your ass off. But you want to do it? Hey, we're here to support you. You want to go to, you know, uh, not those schools? Hey, that's fine. Like, you know, it, it's it's up to you. Go find what in this world, you know, my wife tells the kids all the time, go find something that makes you as happy as that, you know, as daddy's job makes him, right? Like, go find that for yourself. Um, and, you know, and and that's what we want for our kids. But that that is coming from a place of privilege. Right, we have the ability to do that. I can't fault a parent, or I shouldn't fault a parent, and and no you know, or or judge a parent who says, "Look, you know, son, you know, you know, look, Mijo, I need you, you know, I, I, I you got to go be a lawyer or doctor. You got to, you know, you need to go into finance and stay that route. And I need yeah. you to go make this money. The family needs it, right? Like, I, I can't fault a parent for doing that. Like, you know, don't want to sit back and be like, well, maybe there's other ways they can make money. Sure, but I don't know their business, right? I don't know their story. I don't know the challenges they're facing, and so. You know, I do think it's easy to kind of armchair quarterback all this stuff and say, oh, every parent should parent like, you know, me and my wife. No, that's crazy, right? That's crazy. I mean, we don't know what's going on in their households and, and the challenges they're facing other families. So, you know, as much as I, I do challenge all my kids and I do tell them this, like, hey, parent, you know, student comes in and says, hey, Mr. Q, I want to do this, but my parents really want me to do that. And it's like, well, look, first of all, your parents love you more than anything else and they're doing what they think is best for you. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say, hey, it's your life, it's not their life, right? You're the one that has to live it. But understand, even though there's a disagreement, it's not because, it's not solely because they just, you know, they only want you to make money. They want you to be safe. You know, they want to not, you know, they want to know that they don't, you know, if something happened to them, you're okay. Or that you can take care of, you know, you can help out with little brother, little sister. Those are real things that parents worry about. I know because I worry about it myself. And so, you know, again, I think it's easy to kind of paint things with a broad brush and be like, everybody should do this. All parents should do this. Every kid should just go find their, their true North Star. And I do want that for all of my students, for all young people. But I do, I recognize that that's, that, that comes from a, pra a place of privilege to be able to say, go find your true happiness, you know? Well, Doug, and Mr. Cut, I'd like to stop you right there, man, because I feel like you just hit it right on the nail. This is what I loved about your class, right? Because it was like, you you could argue one perspective, right? But you could also take a position of empathy and, and argue the other perspective, right? So it's like I love I loved how you kind of painted things as like nothing is black and black and white. There's a lot of gray area. You know what I mean? There's a lot of ambiguity in terms of like, sure, this parenting style might work for one, you know, demographic or one set of people, whereas the other ones you can't fault them for doing things a different way. And um, I think I think what really opened my eyes to that was when you taught us about uh, we we're talking we we're talking about environmental law, and we we're mm -hmm. talking about how how can you you know you have one side of the nation that's like, all right, we have to do everything we can, you know, to stop like the greenhouse gas emissions sure. and all things of that nature. But it's like 
you have another group where it's like, you know, for generations, these families have made money off the coal yeah. mines. Yeah. And who are you to tell them that they can't put food on the table for their family? Yeah. And it's, 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 I don't know the answer. Sure. Yeah. Well, I know what I'd be fighting for if I was one of those families, right? Like, you know, I'm going to feed my kids, you know, to hell with you and your high mindedness. Now, again, there's bigger problems there's bigger things that we have to be yeah. very real about, but yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. Things aren't black and white. I think it's funny. You, you say that, um, you know, I now since your class, what I what I do day one with all my classes is say, look, the world is served to you in black and white. Everybody tries to tell you you're either with us or you're against us. It's, it's this or it's that. Right. And unfortunately, we've been hearing that from the loudest megaphone, you know, in, in the world, quite frankly, for the last four years. And, and it's just uh, it's just been terrible, not just for politics, but I think for for kind of the fabric of America. And and that's not I don't, I don't think that's a political thing. Now, people, oh, you're being political. I don't know. That's just fact. I mean, when somebody just gets up and lies, when somebody gets up and, you know, brags about assaulting women, when somebody gets up and talks about, you know, you know, you're, I mean, you know, you got to show strength. And I mean, the things that, that, that this individual has said, um, it just, you know, it's, it's so unfortunate. And for me, you know, to your, to what you said about that, what I try and do, what I tell students day one, look, I'm going to talk smack about Republicans. I'm going to talk smack about Democrats. I'm going to talk smack about, you know, uh, you know, conservative, uh, you know, policies. I'm going to talk smack about liberal policies because my job here is to take what, you know, what the world is throwing at you students, which is it's black or white. You're either Republican or you're Democrat. You're either right conservative or you're liberal. You're either, you know, for Trump or against him. You're either for Biden or against him. Everything is put in black and white. My job or so much of what I try and do in my class is to throw gray paint on everything, just splatter gray paint. And it's not to try and say that you're wrong, Alec, in what you believe in, is to say, have you thought of the other side? No, have no. you considered, right, what's around the corner? And again, unfortunately, um, so much of what we've seen, you know, in, in, in the, the dialogue that we've had as a nation and, and in our households and with our family members and with our friends, and former friends and former, you know, close family members over the last several years is just like, no, either you know, you're good or you're bad. It's just yeah. that simple, right? And and that's just, that's not life. I mean, look, there are certain things. You put a kid in a cage, well, that's effed up, right? Like, that's immoral. It's illegal. Like, I don't, you know, there's no discussion to be had there. No there are certain things that's just, we have to be able to say, look, we can agree to disagree and we can be respectful, but some things are just out of bounds, so, right? Yeah. Like, you just, what, what happened last week or two weeks ago now, you know, week and a half, whatever it was at, at, the, at the Capitol, like, I, you know, if you're going to sit here and be like, well, that's, no, it's not patriotism, man. Come on, it's terrorism. If those people would have been wearing, you know, if they, they would have, you know, been chanting, um, you know, uh, glory be to Allah, right? If they'd have been, if they'd have been Muslims, if they'd have been black individuals, come on. Completely. Right? Let's be honest about what you'd be, you know, about so many people would be saying right now. So it would have been a totally and, and, You know, yeah. I mean, you talk about breaking down, beating up police officers, killing a police officer right? Um, st trampling somebody to death just to get in and take this country back. I mean, it's just, you know, it's wrong. It's illegal. It's immoral. It was, it's terrorism, right? Um, and, and we have to be able to just say, look, some things are out of bounds. Some things are out of bounds. But, yeah. but so much of this world, so much of this world, right? We have to allow for differences of perspective. We have to allow for people in different areas, for people from different backgrounds, for people with different religions to have disagreements and still understand that we can be unified in a whole number of things. Um, and it's just unfortunate that in many ways, um, you know, we've, we've gotten away from that. I don't think that's, that's solely because of the, the individual who's getting ready to get kicked out of the White House. I, I, I think it's largely, you know, largely. recently because of him, but that's, it's, it's bigger. It's bigger than him. Bigger, and we, bigger. these are issues we got to deal with. It's bigger than that. I, I, I think that's perfectly said, right? Like life, for the most part, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of gray areas. But some things are out of bounds. Some things are black and white. There's some things that right. aren't negotiable. You know what I mean? Like yep. some things you, you have to stand against or stand for, and, and some things you have to take a, pers a different perspective and be able to empathize, right? That's that's a goal I have for this podcast. So I really appreciate you hitting on that. It's like just bringing on people to have comp conversations about different perspectives so that anyone listening in can kind of see those two perspectives and learn to just empathize with each other. I feel like in the past few years, we've lost a lot of that in this nation in terms of just being able to empathize with someone like you're, you're not good or just, it's not just good or bad sure. people against good. You know what I mean? Like there, there's a sure. lot of gray areas and we have to be able to disagree 
yeah. on certain things that are inbounds, right? Sure. Without, without yeah. beating each other and trying to kill each other, right? Yeah. And then it's hard. It, right? It's hard. It, it is really hard. Yeah. It is really hard. But I, I struggle with it. The empathy, you yeah. can just just trying to recreate a culture where there's more empathy and and less, you know, self righteousness. I feel like it. We we can get yeah. there. But um, so so now yeah. that we're on it, what? What were some of, what are some of like the toughest ethical dilemmas you, you teach in, in your business law class? Like I remember specifically the yeah. train track dilemma where it's like you yeah, tell the trolley problem. Like, yeah. Um are there any more like that where it's like the answer isn't just black and white? There's a little bit of gray area depending sure. on the belief system or stuff like that. Yeah, look, well, first of all, I think there's tons, right? And huh. and I mean there's any number of issues. Here's I think kind of what I've kind of coalesced around the last you know, a couple of years in teaching this class that I really try and lay on pretty thick for, for the students, which is this, this push and pull or this tension between, uh, you know, loyalty and, and honesty. Right. And if you step, if you stop and think about it for a second, like so many of the great movies or, you know, the great novels or whatever have this tension kind of in, inherent um, to uh, to the central theme of, you know, of that, uh, you know, of that uh, book or, or movie or whatever. And, and so kind of like, uh, I don't know if I did this with you guys, but I, I kind of lay out a, um, a hypothetical uh, each semester um, where like, if you're working and, and you're with your best friend, you and your best friend are working together um, and you find out your best friend is stealing from the company. Right. I don't know if you remember that. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and your best friend is stealing from the company, but he's stealing because, you know, his mother doesn't have insurance and he's, you know, she's sick and she needs, you know, she needs help. And, and, and I put a whole bunch of details in, into this thing to try and, you know, but I try and box people in. Right. And, and the whole, the whole way I'm trying to box people in is you got to choose between, you know, a shitty answer and a shitty answer. Right. Like that's all you got. Right. And, and it's amazing because people like, it's, it's, I, I, I really, I love doing that in class because I see, I can see the wheels turning. I see people getting, you know, like into it and I see, Somebody says something and somebody always like, how could you think that way? And everybody's yeah, trying yeah, yeah. and we've got all these kind of things that are going on, right? Internal heated. biases. <laughs> What's that? It gets a little heated in the UTC. Yeah, it'll well, get, it'll, and, and, you know, and obviously it, these, these are fun, engaging I, I love uh, conversations. But, but yeah, and, and, it, and, what it, and I think what it's, I mean, what it's pulling at is people be like, oh, you know, I'm a good person. I'll, you know, I'll always do the right thing. Like, that's just the way I'm wired. Okay, okay, big shot, right? Uh, what do you do? When you're, you know, you know the right thing and the right thing is to turn in your best friend or your brother or, you know, your, your wife or your husband, right? Um, like, it's not easy. And what I'm trying to do with students is not say you need to do this. Now, inevitably, students are like, what would you do, Mr. Keaton? I'll share my thoughts or whatever. But, but I'm not, I, I make it very clear and hopefully you remember this. I don't want you to walk out of the, the, that class or the class when we go over this stuff and say like, <clears throat> oh, I know what Mr. Q would do, now that's what I would do. No, in fact, that's the last thing I want you to do. What I want you to do is walk out of there being like, damn, I thought I knew what I would do, but now I'm not so sure. That's the point, yeah. right? The point is you're 22, you need to start building, or you know, you're 20, a lot of my students are you know, 19, 20, 21. You need to start building the ability to think through these things, right? In, in not just in an emotional way, but also in an intellectual way, work through, it's what I always talk about, you know, get, put tools in the tool belt, right? That, that I'm trying to, you know, all the stuff we talk about in this class, trying to give you tools to work through so that at the end of the day, you can make a decision. I don't care who you are. Decisions like that are hard. But that's life, right? Boss lady is going to come in and ask you to do something you know is not right. It's not a terrible, terrible thing. It's not going to kill anybody. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to crush the company, but it's not right. So do you do it or do you not do it, right? You, you also respect this person and you know that if things don't go well, you know, they're going to get fired. Well, you know, you probably shouldn't do it, but you, but you got to be able to work through instead of just having a knee jerk reaction, right. To be like, Oh, I would never do that. I never do that. Because ultimately there's going to come in time in your life. And, and for most of you all, for most students, for most of people, there's going to be many times in your life yeah. where whatever you pick, it's going to go against something that you believe in, no doubt. right? Whatever you do, you're going to have to choose honesty, right. Or you're going to choose loyalty. You can't choose both. Yeah. You just can't jam people. And, and if you remember, students will be like, well, what if you did this? What if you did that? And I love that because it gives me opportunity to be like, yeah, it ain't going to work. Yeah, believe me, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what if you just talk to your friend? Yeah, it ain't going to work, right? Like, otherwise, I would just I be like, yeah, let's just. And I, I remember very clearly, yeah. man, I, I miss these conversations, man. I haven't had another class that really made me, um, like, struggle 
with my internal conscience, like the questions yeah. you're posing in this class. I miss it, man. I, I don't think people should have those knee jerk reactions. And I remember walking out of your class a few times and I was like, shit, like if you would ask me that question, like a day ago, I would yeah. have answered it with so much certainty, but now I'm walking yeah. out and I don't even, I, I still maybe believe in my side or maybe I saw the, sure. other, the other perspective and I switched, but either way, it's like, I'm not as sure or certain as I was before we had the discussion. And, and that's a good point out because I think, you know, some students will be like, you know, or, and, and in a conversation with an office hours or whatever, it's like, are you just trying to get us to, you know, just to not believe it? Like, no, in fact, it's just the opposite. Whatever it is you decide, right? Whatever it is you believe, whether you're conservative or liberal, whether you're, you know, you come from the country or the city, whether you, you're religious or atheist, whether whatever, right? When you cut through it, what I'm hoping for students is that, again, to not just go with an easier crack, it's not to say that, again, you shouldn't have just convictions, right? You shouldn't be a person of character and know kind of, you know, more, more often than not, like what the right thing to do is. Obviously, that's what I want for all my students. But I just know, having lived life, being, you know, twice the age of most of my students, look, things aren't always pretty, right? And you got to make some decisions. And when those things come, it's like you just said, maybe after some kind of thinking through it and using the tools that you have in your tool belt to kind of walk through the processes of, okay, how do I balance right? These competing obligations. How do I prioritize things? How do I understand the consequences, not just for me, but, you know, for, for my family members, my friends, or for society, or for my community, or whoever's going to be impacted by these things. As you walk through kind of the, the tools that we talk about, you very well maybe end up, you, you may end up on the other, right, into that, believing exactly what you started with, but it will be, as I say, kind of forged through flame. Like, now you know, you're not just going like, I don't, I don't know, there, I've got two, you know, kind of crappy uh, options here I guess I'll just pick this one no that's not how you want to go through your life yeah. you know you give it some thought and you say okay at the end of the day man I'm not sure I'm making the best decision but based on the information in front of me this is the best thing I think I can do and, and, and I think right there that that was what I was so happy to walk away with from the class like it's it's not even what I learned in terms of like this is these are the elements of contract now I know it was it was the process of being able to think through those things that tool belt to say like now I know when I make a decision, I've thought about it from these multiple perspectives, walk through it through these different lenses. And now I'm more certain of the route I want to take, or maybe I've, I've picked a different route, but just having, having the, the knowledge of how to go through that process, how to walk, like you said, towards the flame, like just having that was way more important to me and having, being able to adopt that mindset of like the more empathetic, broad uh, spectrum, dif different, lenses and factors i feel like that's the better way of thinking and a lot of times we don't do it because it's more tiresome it's a longer way of thinking it's hard it's hard it's hard it's hard know? it's it's very easy i had a conversation do you, do you know chris aarons he's also in mccombs he's a marketing professor really cool dude but i talked to him the other day and sure uh -huh. what he was telling me about marketing he's like the best answer is very rarely the easy the easiest or the simplest answer and it goes back to yeah. like humans wanting to cut corners and you know yeah be a little lazy with our thought process right it's yeah. like usually the the best answer is not the easiest and just like right. you know through your class it's like it's not easy to find the best answer there's a process to it but yeah. if you go through it you'll be a little more fulfilled or not a little more a lot more fulfilled with your choices ah, i think so and yeah. Then, yeah. yeah and i think you'll make better choices and i think we see yeah. it all around us right i mean at the, at the far end of the spectrum like making you know ethical decisions challenging ethical decisions where again you're kind of conflicted no matter what you do but i think again it's it, it's relatable to what we see going around going on around us right now i'm sure you remember us talking as well about you know groupthink and uh you know peer pressure essentially you know co uh, conformity bias right which is you know these things that that affect all of us myself included and it's just so much easier to take as fact or as you know the reality what my people on facebook that all believe the same thing i believe are saying because it makes me feel better about my worldview. It makes me feel better about who I am. You know, it makes me feel more right. Um, and I don't need to go research that because they're just confirming what I already believe. So I, you know, it is what it is. It's my, you know, that feed that, that feedback loop, that echo chamber that, yeah, that so many of us live in. And, you know, and that's just dangerous. So looking for the answers, like where you already know, like, like say I, I want that, that reinforcement again to reinforce what I believe that that's that confirmation bias, right? Where it's like, you already know if you go to this group of people, they're going to confirm what you believe and it's going to stroke your ego, make you believe it more. Right. 
Yeah, well, it's yeah, so, so kind of. Yeah, I mean, I think okay. it's it's also it's been, the, the it's notion of so you forget. Forgive me. <laughs> it's, it's no, no, it's a, been a couple of years. Well, and, I, and a lot. Look, I tell them a lot of this stuff too. I'm not. I'm not an expert on on yeah. all these different. You know, uh, on all these different. Uh, you know, uh, heuristics and all these things that we yeah. have. I mean, I. You know, I, I. I look. What I would say. There's a lot of. Uh, you know, overlap with you know, group think and, and cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias and all this stuff. A lot of these things kind of play in, in, in similar situations. What I would say, the thing about confirmation bias is we are pre, like we are, we are biased towards those things. We screen things out that kind of match what we believe already, right? So it's just easier for me, right, to, to seek out and kind of get that feedback look, loop, excuse me, by watching Fox News or MSNBC, yeah. right? Depending upon what I what is I believe, or or in my you know in my little Facebook or Twitter feed, um, and it just makes sense that we're going to screen out and be like, yeah, see, Bobby says that I'm right. You know, Bobby is a you know is a doctor. He's smart. So you know, and it's like, well, yeah, twenty other doctors said the other thing, but you didn't you know you didn't seem to 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 you know latch onto that. It's that kind of and again, there's any number of things at play here, but. Um, but I think that it's just dangerous for us to, again, borrow, you know, as you said earlier, knee-jerk reactions, just like, oh yeah, that's what it is. Well, think yeah. about it. It's, yeah. it's harder to do that. You work your ass off all day, right? You come home, whatever, you kick your feet back, you have a beer, you have a glass of wine, you're just taking it easy. And, and now Mr. Q saying, oh, and, and, you know, if, you know, that issue that's going on at work or that political issue or, you know, the elections tomorrow, you need to do some research. I'm like, man, damn, I just want to. I just want to unwind for a little bit. I don't want to think. I want to check out. I get it. I man, I get it. You know, but the reality is, as as the you know the presser you're talking about before, it's like often, not always, but often that easy answer is not the right one, right? It's easy to be like, I don't know, so and so said this, so I'll just do that. That's you know, be original thinkers. That's what I, you know. It's like the one takeaway, or, you know, one of the two takeaways that I say at the end of class, right? Don't be an ass and think for yourself. And the only way you can think for yourself is. You got to inform yourself with multiple perspectives. Yeah. See, I, I thought I was an original thinker when I walked into your class, right? But and, and we talked about this. But so so there's two types of people, right? When you'd ask a question, there's the people that, uh, you know, you're like, raise your hand if you believe this or raise your hand if you believe that. And there's one, one you know, part of the class that like looks around to see who's raising yeah. their hand so they can go with them. So I thought, oh, I'm an original thinker. But what I realized, like, I'm looking around the class to see who's raising their hand so maybe I can go against the grain and, yeah. and, and, and be the one that's different. And that's not being a, yeah. an original thinker either because it's not just it's not going with what I believe. So that is a contrarian. My, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's a good point. And, I, and, and sure. kudos to you for recognizing that. I can tell you that's exactly what I did when I was, you know, in college, yeah. right? Like, let me, oh, I'm the, I'm the, you know, back yeah. this term wasn't, you know, wasn't, right, wasn't I, go there before. I was, I was woke, right? Or I, yeah, I got but, it. I saw, you know, I read some obscure passage in uh, some article or whatever. I'm like, oh, let me, you know, I can just quote this and I'll look so yeah. smart. It's like, man, that was never about truly, you know, trying to share my perspective. It was about trying to, at least for me, yeah. you know, to, to stand out, right? To be the one, like you said, against the grain. And look, I mean, it should be about, I think, when, and when people can get past our egos, which is so hard to do, exactly. right? But if we can get past our egos, what it was for me. truly, you know, try and just have a, 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 a genuine, honest back and forth about seeking to find truth, you know, um, it's okay to, to not be right. It's okay, as you say, to walk in and be like, I think this, but now I think that. That's okay. okay. That's learning. That shows intelligence, right? That's how you, that's how you broaden your, your perspective. And there's people out there that just think that's a bunch of hogwash. There's people out there who've been pushing for a very long time, like, no, there is one true white, right, you know, way. Um, actually, yeah, that was <laughs> a, a, a little slip there, right? You know, but like, there's one true way. Um, and, and you see some of these people that say around it, like, look, uh, you know, whether it's for political purposes or sociological purposes, whatever, yeah. our country's being taken from us, you know, um, you know, things are, you know, there has to be just one, you know, this one way of thinking. If you go back and look at, um, you know, kind of uh, in, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and some of the, you know, the response to, you know, the, the kind of hippie culture and, and, you know, the civil rights movement of the 60s and some of the, a lot of the other side was just saying like, you know, no, we have to tell people everything exists within this box, either, you know, from, from a religious or a political perspective, everything exists here and this is right and everything else outside this box is wrong. 
and you know, and, and you've got all these crazy hippie or, or liberal, you know, professors um, that are kind of brainwashing our students. And it's like, look, I'm all about challenging my students to think outside of that box. Even if the result is when they, when they, at the end of it, they come right back to, well, everything that was in this box is what I believe in. Great, at least you've put it through, right? You, you, you've thought about it from different angles and different perspectives. You weren't just given something and said, hey, this is truth. Okay, well, I guess that's, you know, it's the end of my search. That's not how, that's not how things should work. And right. I'm just, you know, I think it's unfortunate there's a lot of people out there would say, no, that's, that is how it should work. And, you know, um, no, doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I think I think it's it's just like you said, right? Just even if you come back to that belief, you're going to believe it more strongly now as you put it through that process. Right. I think the important sure. thing is putting it through that process. So like for me, I, I swear, like, I don't know if you remember this uh, little debate we had in class about Gone Baby Gone with Casey Affleck. Oh, yeah. I still I still show it every semester. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. I actually got to bring on, um, her name is Rebecca Pfefferman. She, she, she lives in Austin, but she was the publicist for Casey Affleck. So that was pretty cool. I, br I brought her on the pod like a yeah. month or two ago, but yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll upload that. And I think you, you, you yeah. think that one's pretty interesting. You said Casey and yeah. Ben are actually like, they're, they're very close brothers or they're cool dudes. Yeah. So, but anyways, that, that's an aside. So uh -huh. I remember the movie was some, I mean, you know, the storyline for the movie, I don't want to ruin it for anyone, but sure. it's like, something that came up in class is like i realized a large portion a larger portion of people than i thought mm -hmm. were of the belief that if you go through something in childhood or you've come up in a certain uh household that may have issues that you're doomed to live a life that is mm -hmm. so hard to others or you're yeah. not going to be successful right. or you're going to have yeah. these issues and i, I was shocked it was actually yeah. like a little bit disturbing for me. I actually was like, yeah. for a week, I had like a little existential crisis. because so I was like, yeah. holy shit. Yeah. Like, I've believed this whole time that, you know, when you go through something, you can build resilience and perseverance, sure. and be able to dig a little bit deeper that someone else might not be able to dig. And that'll yeah. be the benefit. But there's another group of people that think that that baggage is uh, insurmountable, that yeah. that's going to plague you forever. So that like yeah. really hit me hard, right? Because me and you yeah. talked about this because I was like, you know, I've, I've grown up and, and seen things, you know, things weren't always pretty, right? Sure. So I was sure. Like, for me, yeah. I've always used that to my benefit, but yeah. to others, that is, uh, that's something insurmountable. And I was like, wow. Yeah, and, and, and again, and that's exactly why I show, you know, or talk about kind of leading up what happens. I don't show the whole movie because it wouldn't be appropriate to show it, but you know, I mean, towards, towards the end, kind of the, the kind of culmination of everything, because again, I think it goes one, it goes back to, the situation where either way the kind of main character has a terrible decision to make it's yeah. there's not a good decision in front of him he's got to choose between two bad options i think but it forces to go beyond to your point it forces us to go beyond just this little girl and ask about okay let's kind of widen the lens like what are we saying now you know if if we can say that this little girl is going to be destined to you know potentially or exposed to you know drugs or um you know other you know, bad things um well first of all i think we can all agree well, we we don't want kids exposed to that stuff yeah. but if they are does that mean that they should automatically be taken away well in some instances i think you know yeah, yeah if the child is in danger like yes there's no question you had there but but where is that line drawn and who gets to make that decision you know and i think to your point again a lot of people are like oh well you know anytime you have a kid who's going to be grown up in a, in a place where it may be like that then, you know, I think we should just put them into a loving home. And it's like, have you thought that through? Mm -hmm. So, you know, anybody, you know, so I don't know if, if I, you know, had a, I don't know, a cocaine problem, right? And I was working through it and going through rehab, like they should just take my kids away from me because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm struggling through. Like, again, maybe yes, if I'm putting my kids in danger, right? But like, just so the second somebody does something wrong, now we're just going to take kids away from them. Like, you yeah. know, and look, I'm all for like putting kids in safe situations, Absolutely. but it goes to this notion of, I think, again, what you're driving at, that some of us, particularly those of us in places of privilege can be like, well, my way of life is the right way. And if other people don't have it, then we need to make them have my life. It's kind of like, so, you know, of course, putting aside like the, the gang violence and the, the, the cartel violence and like, you know, central and, and, and parts of South America, you know, that is a, that's a very real thing, but, but in large parts of, of Mexico or other places, Honduras, whatever, you know, you call little hamlets, little villages, whatever, where they're kind of removed from that stuff. You have very, very poor people 
compared to our standards, right? Who are going to grow up and it's kind of the, the you know, and, and a lot of times the you know, very traditional, right, uh, family hierarchy and, and, and very often, you know, a lot of the young women in these places will grow up and get pregnant, at, you know, 15 or 16. And a lot of us would be like, okay, if you think back to that movie, you think like, this is kind of what, you know, the protagonist was asked to protect this young girl from, right? Like, you can't let her, you know, be pregnant at, you know, at 15 or 16. You can't let her, you know, live in this kind of, you know, this poor, impoverished area or whatever. It's like, so if that's the case, then we should just go, if we have the resource, we should go into Honduras and just take all these, you know, these poor kids away from their parents and take them away, even though many of them, and I'm certainly not all of them, but many of them would be like, I want to live with my family and I'm like, yeah, my mom had me when she was 15. I plan on having babies when I'm 15 or 16. Who are you to say Americans that we have to live your way? Now, again, I'm clearly not talking about places where the kids are unsafe or they're forced to do things they don't want to do. Or, I mean, obviously all those things are out of bounds, but we have to be realistic about the fact that our way of life isn't the only way of life. Right. And what looks like a, you know, happy, safe life to us, isn't exactly what everybody else thinks and that's okay. And, okay. you know, and I think that's what that the, you know, some of those scenes from that movie kind of bring up and it's like, you know, Oh, well, if there's any chance this kid might be around drugs. You got to just get him out of the house. And it's like, well, you know, let's talk about this a little bit. Right. Yeah. Um, and again, I think for a lot of the kids that take that perspective, I'd say the overwhelming majority of them are, aren't, it's, it's just a form of ignorance, not in a bad way, but they haven't been exposed. They've never been asked to think about this. They've always, you know, they've lived in a, you know, very comfortable life. And it's like, oh my gosh, shouldn't every kid have this? Shouldn't every kid have what I had? That's, you can't fault somebody, I think, initially for thinking like yeah, that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that, there's, there's no mal or, or, you know, ill intentions there, in my, you know, generally speaking. I, I think it comes from a place of trying to say, I think everybody should have what I have. But, but then when you start saying, well, it's one thing to say you want everybody to, to have comfort and security like you did. It's another thing to say, now I'm going to go and work to make, you know, my life view or my worldview their reality. That's a different thing. That's a totally right? We have to be careful with those things. Yeah, no. Um, and I think it brings us back to another point you made in class. It's a slippery slope, right? Like, where do you draw sure. the line? Everything's a slippery For slope. Sure. And, and it's, like, sure. it's like how we talk about, you know, once you make one rash decision or one decision that's uh, maybe corrupt or unethical, it becomes that much easier to keep doing it. Yeah. And that's how someone sure. moves themselves. And it happens so quickly, right? It's like, yeah. I used to be this person who had this value system. And just from the... the just making those tiny little decisions. I've ended up down yeah. here and how did I get yeah. here? But it just happens yeah. quickly. Right. And it's like incrementalism. It's, yeah. yeah. Just a little bitty yeah. increments. Yeah. So yeah. like it's a delicate situation. It's like, where do you draw that line when it comes yeah. to you know, going into households and, and taking kids? Like you brought up the Honduras yeah. example, like yeah. I don't know the answer, but um, yeah. yeah, man, no, like, like back to the, the gone baby gone thing though. It was like for, so, so I went through the process, man. This is why I loved it. So I went from thinking like, you know, when you go through something, you, you can come back a lot stronger to like kind of trying to see the perspective of my classmates to where it's like, you'll mm -hmm. never come back the same. Mm -hmm. So for me, that would mean that, you know, some things I've, I've gone through in life, I'd, I'd, you know, carry that with me forever, which I've never believed. You know what I mean? Like I, I grew yeah, up yeah. in a super loving family. Like I've always yeah. felt um, supported, believed in, nurtured it's just you know something some functionalities have uh yeah. have been tough right sure. but um so i went through the process i'm like all right let's take the perspective that uh someone from my background or worse you know can't make it in life or can't be successful and that was like that's that's a dark place i didn't like it it wasn't sure. really, it's like sure. a more pessimistic lens to view life yeah. through and i came back to my to my viewpoint in terms of like you can be perseverant you can get through things and and yeah. adopt different perspectives and be an even stronger person. And I was like, you know what? I believe it three times more now, like three yeah. X now. So it's yeah. like, like you said, you can come back to your original belief after going through sure. perspectives and, and it's like, now you put it through the process and it's bulletproof. So yeah, yeah. man. Well, and let me, and let me challenge you with something because I think, again, I think that I, I love hearing you say what you just said right yeah. there. And I think that shows, you know, a, a maturity and a wisdom um, for your age that, you know, that's impressive. And, and, Thank you. It's one thing to think about these things on an individual level, yeah. right? Which I think most 20 year olds, 25 year olds, you know, do that's kind of natural, right? Yeah. You're kind of, you know, figuring things out. And, and the way you do that is to kind of look inward and, you know, kind of how, you know, what, what things should be and how you see the world. And that's good. 
It's another thing. Okay, okay, you take you take some of these same issues and say, okay, what about it on a macro level? Yeah, that's like, how should these things work for society, right? Because now now you're an adult. Now you're out there voting. Now you're out there picking leaders. You're picking you know local, state, and and, and national leaders to kind of help set policy. And so now it's like, okay, so I know what's right for me and my kids. What what's right for everybody? Like, what kind of policy should yeah. we fight for? What you know, what kind of politicians and you know, uh, you know, policymakers should I, you know, do I want to, to see, you know, at the helm? Because, again, as I just said, I don't believe what works for necessarily me and my wife is what should work for everybody, but we still have to make some decisions. Okay. We have to be able to, you know, like what, you know, what are we doing? What, you know, I, I read a deal today about, you know, some of the things that kind of gone under the radar over the last four years. And, and just like, wow, I mean, you know, all the stuff that we hear about and all the salacious things and all the, you know, so look, suffice to say, I am no fan of Donald Trump. I think he's a guy who's a despicable human being um, and, and just brought shame to the office and frankly, shame to our country. Um, and, and I just can't wait for him to be gone. That is not to say that, you know, uh, I, you know everything that, that this administration has done is bad. There's been a lot of stuff that we didn't talk about because, you know, we, we've talked about all the, you know, the, the salacious stuff, right? Um, but in addition to some of the things, it's like, wow, the, the administration should get credit for these things. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, there's also a number of things that the, the administration, we just, we, it's like, some people are just like, I don't even know, I, like, yeah, that's terrible what they did, but I can't even, I don't even have any enemy to be upset about this anymore. And, and it's just crazy when you think about the policies, how many people have lost, you know, abilities that, that how many people, how many millions of people would have been, you know, qualified for overtime had the Obama era, you know, a lot of people that were, cha that were at the, at the, the Capitol last week that were sitting here saying, you know, the, you guys don't care about me. Well, the Trump administration rolled back things that would have given those people, right, more money through overtime. Things, you know, people that would have gotten financial assistance, you know, through the SNAP program and, and you know, uh, all, no, you know, any number of things where, you know, th this administration, now again, we can have disagreement about whether, you know, again, fiscally this makes sense, it doesn't, but, but just, it, it's crazy to me when we say, okay, we've got to make policies that affect everybody, not just my yeah. household. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and again, I think that we should always have a good open and honest back and forth about these things. Um, and and we, we absolutely need to have conservative voices and liberal voices, right? And people out, you know, on both kind of the fringes and definitely people who are moderates. We should have all these voices at the okay. table to figure out, you know, wh where we should be. But it's hard, Alec, I think, when you figure out what it is that you believe for yourself to then take the next step and say, okay, yeah. now what kind of policies am I going to vote for for the people around yeah. me? That's, right. that's a very valid point, right? Like it's, it's a tough situation already to find out what's best for you and your family individually, but then it's an incredibly hard, you know, thing to figure out what's best at scale, right? For other yeah. families, you that's know right. what I mean? Yeah. In terms of policy and just in yeah. terms of how to, how to raise certain people or, or things yeah. like that. Like, yeah. you know, the, the things that, you know, happened for me that have led to where I'm at today in life. Maybe it wouldn't have worked for other people. And I totally know that. I totally know that. So having that awareness for yourself and then just having the awareness to think, okay, at scale, what would this be like? I think those are the yeah. questions we got to ask in terms of like, what kind of policies we want to vote for, yeah. right? So what was law school really like, man? Because we all hear it's hard and time consuming sure. and this and that. What What is it really like? Like, so... Yeah, great question. Here's what I say about law school. And, you know, <laughs> um, look, it is challenging, but you got to put it, I think, or I challenge my students that are getting ready to go to law school, you know, to put it into context. Um, you hear these horror stories from people about how hard it is and how, you know, crazy it is, whatever. And the reality is when those people are telling these stories, you know, they're looking back for the vast majority of the students in law school. The reason they remember it so, so challenging is because at that point in their life, it was hands down the hardest thing they had ever done. Like not even close, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're 23, 24, 25 going, you know, going into law school, you know, maybe worked a year or two or maybe just right out of undergrad. And they, I mean, look, it's kind of like, you know, you're in high school and then you go to college. You're like, oh, okay, I can't really just go spy anymore. Like it's a little bit different. It's the same kind of thing. Like, oh, well, I got to show up and like, you know, uh, unlike Mr. Q, who's going to say, hey, Alec, you know, tell me about this case. And you're like, oh, Mr. Q, I didn't read I'm like, oh, come on, Alec. And I go on next person. <laughs> in law school, most professors are going to be like, and, and I shouldn't say most, but many professors would say, okay, Mr. Alvarez, need you to get your books and leave class. 
right? Um, you know, like if you show up, you didn't prepare, like there, okay, well, I'll we'll wait for you to read the, read the case. And we'll, you know, like that kind of stuff in law school. No, not all professors are like that. You got a bunch of, you know, more laid back professors, but a lot of them are, you know, like you're here, you're in law school, you know, you better show up prepared and not just having read it, but understand it. Like you're going to, you know, and so, you know, that kind of the angst and the anxiousness that goes along with, with that, um, you know, or I should say the anxiety that, that goes along with that, um, that's tough. Yeah, that and so for most people at 24, they've never had anything like it. Well, for me, it was different. And I'm not going to say for one second law school is easy because it wasn't. It was a challenge for me, mostly just kind of the back and forth and, man, you know, the family and the commute and whatever. But it was just, you know, I'd worked for you know, six, seven years at that point. And, you know, it's like, it's a job. You show up, you, you get your stuff done and, you know, you don't mess around. I would spend, you know, certainly several hours a day in the library. I say several, I don't know, anywhere from two to four, depending upon the day, maybe one, if you know, on a Friday or whatever. Um, but, you know, the deal that I, the, the agreement I have with my wife is like, look, you know, here's some parameters, right? She's got, you know, babies at home she's caring for and she's working. And she got pregnant, right? And had a new baby. And it's like, look, we put some parameters. Here's my work hours for law school outside of that. We're going to be together as a family. And if that means my grades aren't going to be as great, so be it, right? But so to do that, I had to be efficient. I got in the library and, you know, I'd spend whatever, three hours studying this day and I would, you know, get there and, and get it done. And, you know, whereas the other people would spend two or three times the amount of time in the library, but they're talking, they're on Facebook, they're doing, you know, they'd stay till midnight or one o'clock studying and it's like they weren't studying yeah. I was out of there by 4 p.m and done you know um and now look that takes discipline and discipline that I would not have had at 23 or 24 yeah I had it at 30 partially because I was older I had worked yeah, and partially you. because frankly I didn't want to be you know worried about school when I could be with my family I wanted to be with my family you know and um so you know I think it's hard Alec it, it, it's a lot of work and it's definitely harder than undergrad. It takes more preparation, and there is a shit ton of reading. Um, I mean, a ton of reading. Um, like, you know, there's some, like, you know, you've got class today, you've got a day off, and the next day you're on, and you have 200, you know, 20 pages to read. And then you've got two other classes that you got to prep for. Like, there is a ton of reading. So, but it's, you know, look, class, are you reading, like, about 200 pages? Or it, how, how it varies. Per class? It varies, okay. Oh, man, gosh, it's, you know, I graduated from law school in 2013. Say again? A minimum, what are you reading? Like per, per night, per day? Uh, I don't know. At minimum, 50, 75 pages, you know? That's um, cool, man. Yeah. But, but again, reading. but, but, but if you do the math, right? If you do the math, now I'm saying that's, you know, assuming you're not doing it on weekends or whatever, but if you do the math, even if I'm, I'm a relatively slow reader, okay. you know, that's going to take me a couple hours. Right. Like you, it's, I mean, cause again, you've got how many hours you take in 15 hours of law school classes. You're only in class, what, you know, three hours a day. Right. So you're in class three hours a day. If you're going to think of full work day as, you know, eight, nine hours. Right. That gives you six hours to study. Right. If you go, and even if you're a slow reader like me, it's going to take you two to three hours a day. If you go and you, you know, like, again, I've got an hour block between my class. Well, you can go and mess around. Or you can go and get an hour of reading done. Right. It takes yeah. discipline. I, what I'm trying to say to you is, if you told me, you know, if you truly put in 40 to 45 hours a week between class and reading, right? That's not a crazy work week. That's not. That's a solid work week. That, you know, work. for a lot of you coming out of coming out of undergrad right now, that's actually a pretty light work week, right? But if you put in 40, let's say 40 to 50 hours a week, I'm telling you, you can get everything done. Now, you may not master it, right? If you want to master it, maybe you got it. You obviously got to go the extra mile. But I'm telling you, right? Like. I'm a sharp guy. I'm, not, I'm never the smartest guy in the room. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a sharp guy. I finished in the top 20th percentile doing everything I'm telling you right now. I didn't, I didn't, could I finish, in, you know, maybe in the top 10 or top five? I don't know. I could sit here and tell you, sure, I could if I'd have put more, spent more time. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, right? I did well, but I did not study nearly as, in terms of the amount of time as much as my students, not because I'm so much smarter than them. In fact, most of the people I went to law school with that I was around are just naturally smarter than me. That's not being modest. That's just be, me being honest, right? Um, but I was just disciplined. I had to be disciplined, right? Because I already had a family um, and, and wanted to be with my family. And so, look, I, look, what I would say is 
probably estimate about twice the amount of reading that you're doing right now in undergrad. Maybe, you know, for some of you, maybe more, some of you, maybe less, depends on your, on your, your, um, you know, your major. But I, I'm telling you, you know, uh, probably twice the amount of reading that you have. But if you do the math, right, if you kind of put the parameters around it and look at, you know, how much time, you know, th that you can actually get it done. If you get in there and you, you know, from eight to five every day, you're going to be working. I'm telling you, you can get all of your reading done and, and do pretty well at understanding it if you're disciplined at doing it. Yeah, and then you can still have your Friday nights and Saturday nights and maybe study a little bit about on Sunday and kind of get out front, you know, prep things out or whatever, but it's kind of what I did. But, you know, I didn't work on Friday nights. I didn't work at all on Saturdays. Most Sundays, I probably would only study an hour or two. I didn't do a whole lot. Now, of course, that's different around finals, just like it is an yeah. undergrad. You know, you got to step things up. But, you step but up. I had my weekends off. I wasn't, you know, studying all weekend. I some like some of my, you know, fellow law school students were, and, and you feel that same kind of, you know, peer pressure, that confirmation bias, all stuff we talked about, like, oh, if they're studying, I better do it too. And it's like, mm -hmm. I just wasn't worried about that, you know, because, you know, if I just wasn't going to do as well as them, that was going to be the consequence. But I had other bigger things. And so just my perspective on it was different. I got you. Yeah, no, it sounds very doable if you're very disciplined, right? And, and like yeah. said, you're like, uh, um, if you're I like it's doable state. even if you're not disciplined. It's doable if you're not yeah. disciplined. It's just going to be a lot more. It's just going to. It's yeah. going to take a lot more time, right? I mean, there's you know, well, see, there's I, a lot I'll, of people. I'll fall in that category, right? I need to get more on your game because I'm like in there and I'm like, oh, let me, oh, you know, I'm a very social guy, so it's like, oh, I see this from what's up, what's up, we talk. Yeah, you want to go? I'm, yeah. I'm on my phone, and then it's like sure. and those little breaks you keep, they keep disrupting your rhythm, right? So yeah. it just be so much longer. So I need to get more on your flow, yeah. get disciplined, yeah. and just knock it out, man. Well, and I also think that's one of the reasons I do think that I'm sure there's studies on this. There's probably a, you know, not just correlation, but some causation of higher scores with, you know, people that took a, a couple of years off and went and worked because you learn, it's like your boss, you know, boss man or boss lady is like, you know, Hey, Alec, I know you've got this, you know, assignment or not this assignment, this, you know, presentation that's, you know, due tomorrow. I, I got another one I need you to do two days from now that, you know, clients come in you're like, shit, you know, well, yeah. what are you going to say? No, no, you're going to get it done. You learn. It's like, man, Hey, you know, Billy, I know we were going to, you know, hang out tonight. I can't, I got to, you know, I gotta work. you just, you just get it done. You do that. And that's what I kind of had working. I went and worked in nonprofit for a couple of years and I came and worked in the family, you know, business for a couple of years and you just learn like stuff's got to get done. And, you know, yeah. there's certain times like, Hey, you get everything done and, you know, you leave early. Like, you know, the, the, the healthcare company, my wife and I worked at, you know, like rarely were people in the office, like, you know, um, for a number of years, you know, after 3 PM on a Friday, it's like, Hey, let's just get our stuff done. We'll leave early and go hang out together. But yeah. it meant that on the, the rest of the time, like you got to get your shit done. You know, and I think learning that, um, you know, uh, for and, and, and kind of just internalizing that for a couple of years makes law school, you know, easier, frankly. And, and because you're trained now, like, yeah, I'm just I got to get my stuff done. No doubt. Yeah, no, I think that's a big thing that the young folks should, should consider, you know, instead of like uh, spreading things out and not getting like yeah. a full, intense, awesome study and also that good family time or a good time with your friends. Sure. Like, I feel like people should just more intensely just discipline, get it done, boom. It yeah. feels better. Now you can go hang out. You don't have that anxiety. Like, Shit, I got to get this done. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like that's something us young folks should adopt more, but it's funny when you it's said- It's hard. People, I mean- yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't have done it at 23. I couldn't have done it at 23. It's tough. I was able to do it at 30. I couldn't have done it at 23. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Right? Ho hopefully, hopefully by the time I'm 30, I'm, I'm on the same wave. I could just boom, yeah. get in there, get it done. I'm, I'm working on it, man. I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm trying to be more mindful of it all. But I think it's funny a minute ago when you said uh, how uh, in law school, you, it's not like business law with you where you can walk in and like, Alec, uh, what happened in this case? You're like, oh, I didn't read yeah. this. Because yeah. that specifically didn't happen. But there was times where like, yeah. you know, me and you talked all the time. So I was like, yeah. Well, who read this case? Who wants to talk about it? And you'd kind of look over yeah. at me and we'd make eye, eye contact. I'm like, yeah. oh, shit, please don't. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> please don't call it. me. I, I, can't, I can't save us today, Mr. Q. Don't, don't yeah. call on me. But yeah, um, yeah man. So really yeah. quick, uh, a, little, a little rapid fire to end yeah. it off if, if you're ready. Okay. You know, you can just answer yeah. a, few, a few words, a sentence or two. So Dallas versus Austin, man. I know you lived in both. We've talked about it before. I love Austin. I grew up in Dallas. And you yeah. grew up in Austin and you lived in Dallas for a time. So yeah. really quickly, what are the differences and why do you prefer one over the other? That's a great question. I, I prefer Austin because I grew up here. 
Okay. Right. Um, I do think, I do think that Austin still has more of a small town vibe though. I think that is quickly changing. Um, I think you can find small pockets of Dallas that are more Austin than Austin nowadays. Um, but I love my town. Every time I leave Austin, I come back just like, I love living here. It's far from perfect. So is Dallas. Um, both of them are remarkably segregated. I mean, ridiculously segregated, um, but they're good places. I, 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 there's some really cool places in Dallas, but Austin is, is my home. It's where my heart is. So where are those pockets at, man? Where are those Dallas pockets you're talking about? Yeah, you know, I mean, like, um, oh, gosh, like, they've, you know, I know they've done, like, uh, Deep Ellum is, is kind of, you know, been changed over by, um, Arts. yeah, Bishop, Bishop Arts, Arts, exactly, Arts. yeah, uh, my buddy's got an office, most. yeah, I'm sorry, say that again? No, so that's where I see it the most, over by Bishop Arts. Yeah, Art. yeah, and, and look, and at a certain point, like, I went there, you know, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, we'd have dinner with our friends, mm -hmm. my, my in-laws are from, uh, are from up there, my wife is from there, and so, so my in-laws are up there, and our best friends live up there. So we're up there. I mean, obviously the last nine months, we haven't been up much, but, but pre COVID we're up there, I don't know, every other month. And so we'd go to Dallas a, a good amount. I do feel like, you know, Bishop arts is like at a certain point, it's like, all right, it's a bit much now. Yeah, like, no, I don't need to pay $18 for a drink. You know, like this is a bit much. <laughs> um, and, and I do feel some of that stuff's happening in Austin as well. So I, you know, to be fair. Um, but no, I think, I think because Dallas is just so darn big, there's some really cool pockets there um, yeah. that I like. I just, I like places that it's not all, um, it's not all cookie cutter. You yeah. know, uh, I, I like, you know, where you can see a, you know, a big nice house next to a place where you know that, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a Vietnam vet's been living there for, you know, for, for, you know, 30, 40 years. And, you know, like that, it's, it, you know, next to a, you know, person that just moved in, you know, with a young family. And like, there's just like, there's some, character there right yeah. there's differences there it's not all just the same kind of people and and uh and again i love where i live the neighborhood that i live is still has a little bit of that and, and that's one of the reasons i just you know, no, I, I love I, being here i agree man I, I love that about austin i love how you put that you know it's like you have people from totally different backgrounds kind of like mixing in there a little mm -hmm. bit more in austin as opposed to where dallas is like you know it's it's a little more bougie it's a little more up and yeah you can't yeah. just walk in certain places and wear whatever where i feel like yeah austin, absolutely a lot of that you know what i mean so yeah. You know, I love my city, but it's definitely a lot more of that bougie-ness, you know, yeah. the word we're looking for, uh, as opposed to Austin, man. But excited to see him yeah. keep going. Um, so three characteristics of, of a good lawyer or what someone needs to, like, get through law school. Integrity, integrity, and integrity, right? I mean, you got to be, you got to be honest. I mean, there's just so much pressure to, to you know, um, to cheat or to lie or you know that's true in law school that's true in life right that's true in any in any career path but and just you just gotta be you gotta be honest right and if you did you studied and you know you, you show up and you're ready for the test or for the for the case great let the chips fall where they will if you didn't let the chips fall where they will right but don't don't cut corners because you didn't you know because you're afraid of not looking as good, right? Like just be um, a person with integrity, I, I, you know? Um, and I think that's true in any career path, but it's definitely true with lawyers because why do lawyers get such a bad rap? Because so many of them don't have a lot of integrity. They'll say whatever it takes. I mean, they're slimy. I, I know, I know a lot of attorneys, great people. A lot of attorneys, not great people, you know? Um, and I think there's something where people just make it okay to, to just lie. You know, and now again, to be fair, some attorneys, if you, you know, you're defending somebody, you've got a client like, you know, hey, that's your job. You got to go out there. Um, I respect people that, you know, defend somebody who maybe they're not sure they did it or didn't do it. Like everybody needs a good defense attorney or, you know, whatever. I, I'm not trying to say that, you know, they, you know you, you're wrong if you're just you're, you're defending somebody who maybe isn't a good person or whatever. I'm not saying that. I mean, just like being a slimy person that's willing to say anything for a buck or yeah. to get the next big case or whatever. It's just, and it catches up with you and it's just gross and you know, it's not worth it. Yeah, no, I hear a lot of, a lot of politicians who used to be like DAs, for example, you know, putting people away for that, that were innocent just to keep their, you know, undefeated yeah. as their time as a DA. And that, that's, that's sick, man. That's, that's directly affecting people's lives, you know, and that's, I don't like that, sick man. people. Yeah. So sick I love people. integrity, man. Yeah. So, um, the three things that motivate you the most in life, man? 
Uh, my family. Um, I, uh, I guess it's trying to encourage people to think for themselves mm -hmm. and which, you know, for me is teaching, which is why I love this job so much. Um, and, and just trying to, um, trying to get as much out of this life as I possibly can. I, you know, I believe we've got one shot at this and that's just something that motivates me. Um, you know, that just, yeah, I find myself like everybody else, you know, just like, man, I, you know, two hours later, like, what am I doing? Right. Um, yeah. just, you know, like look at something outside your window and be like, man, it, what did it take to create that thing? Whether it's a building or a tree or a whatever. And I know that sounds a little like, Oh, you know, here we go. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's hard for me to naturally always appreciate those things. Yeah. Right. Some people it just comes naturally. It doesn't come from me naturally, but I'm motivated to try and appreciate those things more. That's just, you know, somebody built that fence, somebody, you know, planted that tree, somebody, you know, and, 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 and the, the energy that it took to grow that tree. And I mean, you know, uh, for some people, that's a bunch of hogwash and that's fine. But for me, that motivates me to try and just get as much out of this life as I possibly can to try and, and you know, I guess the, maybe the more contemporary way of saying it is to be present, yeah. right? Um, to be present. And it's not easy for me. It's a lot easier for other people that I know that just are I feel you, man. just, you know, more naturally present, but so my family motivates me trying to encourage young people to think for themselves motivates me and trying to just soak up as much as I possibly can from this life motivates me. I love that, man. That's, that's beautiful. That, those are like just prime example, like just intrinsic motivators for you to do what you do and, you know, put food on the table and, and make the world a better place, man. I love it. Um, I'm still, I'm still looking for mine, but I know family is a core pillar of mine and, uh, just trying to make the world a more genuine place. And also for me, just like, I agree with you, man, we only have one shot at this and why not make it as, you know, passion filled and fulfilling and as happy as possible, you know, and like for yeah. me, meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meaningful. Right. So I'm, I'm also not naturally a very present person. Like I have some friends that are more like on the tree hugger side of things. Like, oh, yeah. It's just so beautiful. The tree, the art, yeah. this and, that. and I can't, right. So it's, it's a lot yeah. more of an effort for me, but I'm, I'm getting there, man, trying to appreciate it all. So Mr. Q, it's been fun, man. And, uh, I, I'm catching up. Uh, we went shoot like almost an hour and a half. Um, yeah. I don't know if I went over for you, but, but it was fun. No man. worries. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was cool catching up. I hope some people get some value from this, man. And as you certainly said, and one of the one of the best, brightest professors at UT Austin. <laughs> this class. Well, at UT. <laughs> well, thank you, Alec. And it, it's been a pleasure. And and again, I'll never forget. You know, like I said, you coming to me on that second class day, and 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 I've shared that story with a number of people. You know that that I recognize. You know, not only what an honor it is to have, you know, to do what I do, but also that there's a responsibility that comes with it, you know, and I, I just, for the myriad of reasons that I love my job, I mean, at the top of the list, it's being able to have conversations like this, you know, with you and to, to know, you know, the, the, the interesting and, and amazing things that you and so many others will do, you know, after, after you graduate, it's just, I mean, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be able to do what I do. It's, it's, uh, it truly is, uh, um, a, a special thing. And, uh, so no, I, I appreciate you having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, man. No, I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Your energy is infectious, man. And just want to, just want to put it out there for the rest of the world, man. Keep, keep inspiring the people. Keep doing you. <laughs> Thanks, All right, Alec. You. Well, Hey, have All a right. great 2021. We'll, we'll talk soon, man. Take it easy. Take care, buddy. All right. Bye-bye. Don't be such a smart ass.